where we're going to walk to out there, uh, you'll be able to see part of it that I haven't done anything to yet and just see how thick and impassable that is now. But in 1938, that was mostly open. The hillsides were mostly open and probably even earlier than that, they were almost completely open except for scattered large oak trees. And a lot of those old scattered bur oak trees are still standing out there. They never got cut, cut. I guess the bur oaks were just not that attractive for timber. And um, so they just are still out there, many of them. That is certainly a remnant oak savanna and probably had widely scattered oak trees and just grasses and native grasses and forbs underneath it before um, you know, European settlers came and started to break this up and farm it, which in this area was in about the 1880s. So that's, that's the idea. I'd love to see that remnant oak savanna exist as parkland again. I don't want to use chemicals and I don't want to mow it. And I think the answer that I'm, that I'm going to try to use and put in place is the combination of fire and grazing, which is basically what it was years ago. And um, the Indians probably set lots of fires, and there were a lot of natural fires. And the bison and elk and deer and everything that grazed through here did the grazing. So I'm going to try to, to use that system to recreate uh, and maintain the savannah. And I also think that it can fit into my grazing operation. I don't ever expect to be able to graze it as heavily as I graze these cool season, relatively flat pastures because it's pretty steep and you got to respect that. But there could be times of the year if we get a hot summer and the cool season grasses kind of quit, we can go in there in the shade, partial shade, and, and graze some in the summer. And then the thing I've learned about these cool season pastures is that they need to be rested in the fall. And so um, I need somewhere to go. Lots of, lots of guys go from their pastures to corn stalks. I don't have any corn stalks. So, um, so maybe the, the native grasses can come into the picture as a place to go in the fall when I'm trying to rest my cool season pastures. So the goal is, I think, no more than 50% canopy cover. And the question is, how, what kind of tree spacing will give us that? Um, I'm mainly going to try to, you know, if I'm going to plant something, it's going to be bur oaks. But what I'm trying to get to is, is how close to plant the trees. And what these are back here in these cages where I've gotten mostly bur oak trees and a couple of other little odd things. Those are on basically 60 foot spacings. Uh, so you, that's kind of hard to get your mind around a little bit in that um, 60 feet apart, you know, they look fairly close, but you only end up with 12 trees per acre if you, if you regularly space them 60 feet apart. Um, and I, on our farm, have started um, with the target spacing of about half that. I've got my tree spacing at about 25 to 30 feet in the first thinning, and that's enough it's not that 50%, it's more shade than 50%, but it's enough to get the forage established, and it gives the trees a little bit of time, the ones that are left, a little bit of time to adjust, and then I'm gonna come back and take out probably 50% of the trees that still remain. So it's kind of a two-step process that I'm experimenting with. The nice thing about the way that um, skid steer with a grapple worked First of all, that's another reason to cut the stumps off at the ground so you can run a skid steer on tracks in there to pick those, uh, pick up all the cuttings. And, um, but, the, but that skid steer on those rubber tracks did a nice amount of disturbance of the soil. Not overly, uh, not like what a bulldozer does, and he didn't tip out any stumps or, or disturb the soil in that way because that tips up big root balls and, and really uh, makes a much bigger mess, but it did kind of, um, uh, there wasn't much, you know, grass or ground cover in there because it was so thick and, and the sun wasn't hitting the ground, but that left a nice coating of dirt. And so right after we got done, I came out just with a, a hand crank cedar and, and spun these oats on. And um, the places like right behind me, that was a little more open and there was more light hitting the ground. So we've got 
cool season grasses and things edging into it there and that oats didn't come very well there but where the ground was bare and where there was bare dirt the oats took a hold pretty well and we've got a, a fairly decent stand it's a little thinner on that steeper part over there so i don't know for sure whether that's gonna you know like i say dry down and be thick enough to carry a fire but that's that's what i hope whether it does or not the other approach is that i'll spin on uh, cereal rye this fall and then make the cows go in there for a while and trample it in and then if they if they get around and trample in uh, then I think that'll take and come on and, and be able to carry a fire next spring. And what I hope will happen is that there's enough native seeds in the soil to come and there are enough patches around open patches out in the woods where I can see um, uh, blue stems and, and side oats grama and quite a lot of different grasses that I don't know how to identify, as well as forbs that come in these patches. So I think that, um, that there's a pretty good seed bank of these natives out there. I'm just kind of curious to see what'll come on its own. And it would be great if it will come on its own. And if not, then we might have to resort to, uh, to seeding it. And maybe we'll need to seed some things that are missing in the long run. I struggle to sort of try to envision what, you know, what the mix of species should be when we got done because it surely wasn't just burrow trees. There had to be other big trees and there had to be understory trees and brush and wild plums and, and all the whole diversity of things. Right. So what, what should we look for and expect? And then when you get into the prairie layer, the grasses and forbs in there, what should we look for and hope to find? But there could be things that plants or, or microbes or whatever that provided some sort of ecological function that aren't there now. And we need to sort of, in order to know that, we have to look at what is there compared to what we think used to be there, or what little we know about on the microbe scale, and see if there's something missing and that we need to try to provide. I, I think that piece is kind of what distinguishes this approach from just a uh, go out into the pasture, plant trees, and have cool season grasses, and you know, orchard grass, red clover, and some kind of a tree crop. Like that's really sustainable agriculture, right? Yeah. Super good for water quality, good for carbon, good in a lot of ways. It's not exactly ecological restoration, or it's not as much ecological restoration as this could be with native tree species spaced in a way that mimics a you know, more historical ecosystem, and that brings back native plants, native you know, forbs and grasses that might help native insects, native birds, like that's where you get the ecosystem benefits that are broader than just erosion control and carbon sequestration and that kind of thing. So I think there's a, there's room for both. Like, right. you know, we turn more cornfields into rows of trees and cool season grasses, that'd be awesome in so many ways. But this change too, I think is important for the broader ecosystem that, that you know, just alley cropping pastures doesn't give you. So, it might just depend on what your goal is. If it's more ecosystem restoration, then maybe that idea of 100 foot spacing or more makes sense if those are the species that are going to be underneath. If it's more on the side of sustainable agriculture, then you probably want your trees to be pretty, you know, as close together, especially if the trees are a crop and it's just a different mindset, but they're obviously right. similar principles. Start doing this thinning, um, you, there's a lot of pretty good sized logs in here. And so the question is, could there be, can you get any value about, from those? I, I cut a lot of the cedars and used, and made, made a lot of posts out of them. And, but the more general question, I wondered what people think about it, is what to do with the slash. So we pushed it into these ravines. Right here, just right here, there are, there's six or eight pretty good sized logs down in that ravine. So. I, I just don't, you know, we sort of did it because I didn't have any other good idea. And if you have a, a skid loader in here on tracks, couldn't you mount a chipper onto the front instead of a grapple and then, and then chip into piles and then you know, scoop them up later? Yeah, I mean, you could. It's, you got to cut them so they will go through, you know, so it's a little extra chainsaw work. A lot of these came down as just cut once at the bottom and then picked up the whole tree and got it into the ravine. So that minimized the chainsaw work. 
Um, but yep, it could wood chips could be done. There's also an economic opportunity there. Someone who has a chipper and knows the, the dairy, because when you talk about, you know, you've got your carbon and your nitrogen combination there, and the fact that the that the tips will actually um, hold on to the nitrogen so it doesn't um, volatilize. I mean, it's a win-win-win. Yeah. But it's almost as though it's too much for you to do. But if there were economic development options in the county that said, if, if you like outdoor work, if you like working with machinery, if you like helping the environment, here's a, a niche for you that's between the landowner and the person who wants this high value mulch. I think the combination of, of a chainsaw guy dropping those down and, and lopping off the tops and then he can he can mulch those tops off when they're after they're cut off and then you're left with logs, which are kind of easier to handle and might be salvageable with some value. So there's some parts of it that, that we're gonna try that and see whether that'll uh, how that'll